you see the Villa Arsenal result? Oh, I did. I was uh, I was refreshing that quite a bit on my phone, thinking, "Come on, Villa!" <laughs> yeah. G'day Spurs fans, it's Paul the Hotspur Hippie here, the one and only psychedelic soccer show on the internet, and boy have I got a treat for you, I've mucked around with this, so it's a big Steve and a little me, but that'll do, I'm not touching it, a man that needs no introduction, but it's fun anyway, so I'm going to do it, our most decorated player, uh, signed on as a schoolboy for Tottenham Hotspur, by far the greatest football team the world has ever seen, in 1967, finished playing for us 1986, 854 appearances, 39 goals scored in every season he played for us. Winner of the League Cup in 71-73, winner of the FA Cup in 81 and 82, and winner of the UEFA Cup in 71 and 84, uh, 72 and 84, and Player of the Year in 1982 after leaving Spurs, went on to a successful managerial career uh, with spells at Tottenham, even though we were you know, owned by a clueless spiv at the time. But then more glory followed in, in Japan with uh, with Aussie and in his own right with uh, Shimzu S. Pulse, J-League Manager of the Year 1999. It's my great honour, uh, one of only three posters on my bedroom wall. It was Steve Perryman, Aussie Ardelius and Debbie Harry. Welcome Steve Perryman, the skipper. How are you, Steve? Yeah, great. Thank you. Well, what an honour. And uh, thank you for what a trio on your bedroom That's, wall. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> Fantastic. I'm really happy to be with you. Um, I expect it's early in the morning there, isn't it, for you? 7am, 7am. Oh, brilliant. Well done. But so uh, I have the feeling you're a punctual man, so I was up early trying to get this working. So <laughs> Sure, sure, sure. Well, 8 o'clock here. Um, I've had a good day. Um, we had a, a players get together yesterday. Oh, nice. Up in, up in the city sort of area of London and uh, Aussie... Mark Falco, Mark Bowen, Tony Galvin, Chrissy Hewton, Clive oh. Allen. So, uh, yeah, it was a great uh, Christmas get-together. We do it once a year. And, um, well, we do it more than that, but we definitely do it at Christmas. So uh, so when I got home, I was a bit tired. Um, so, anyway, went to see my brother today, who's been uh, quite ill, but he's now out of hospital. So I'm delighted with that. And uh, come back and just saw the end of the Aston Villa uh, game. So quite happy with that result, of course. It's not a, it's not a bad start to my day, that either. That was uh... yeah. Now, I bet. Now for people watching, I've I've um I've switched off super chats for this stream. Um, if you want to say thanks for what we're doing here, there's a link to uh, the Aortic Dissection Charitable Trust, a uh, charity that Steve's involved with. So instead of uh, Give me a few quid if you want to say thanks to Steve <laughs> and thanks to me. Then uh, you can click on the link and give them a few bucks. So I'm a, I'm, I'm an ambassador for those. Uh, that was because the the problem I had about 12 years ago was an aorta dissection, and so I'm a survivor of that. Um, the the chances of you surviving it 
is uh, only 10% of people make it to hospital. So of a thousand people, uh, only a hundred make it to hospital. Out of those hundred, only 5% survive. So that's five out of a thousand. And if you do survive, um, you probably haven't got all your marbles. So I absolutely missed the bullet. I missed the bullet because the f- the first you know first people I came across, be it the St John's ambulance or the local hospital in Exeter, and and the uh, uh, helicopter uh, Devon Air ambulance to Plymouth, seven hour operation. So, but anyway, as I laugh laughingly say at some of my talks that if I'd have survived as I have but I didn't have all my marbles, then perhaps I would have been a pundit on television. (laughs) So, yeah. Speaking of pundits, because they seem pretty good at picking things apart. Uh, I just want to, because I just want to get your thoughts. Like me as a footballer, my, my schoolboy career was, uh, was a total of 15 minutes. I was in goal. (laughs) I I, I let three goals in, in 10 minutes and was substituted. And that was it. It was a long ride home on the back of the bus. Good, good night. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so me as a football player, useless. How, how does it feel as a player when you've got people like me? And, you know, even though we're a positive a lot of the time, sometimes we can be, you know, a little bit nasty and maybe give you advice on how to play the game. How does that sit with players? Um, I'm not sure about the general players, but, um, yeah, the people are entitled to their opinion. Of course they are. And they're entitled to see it from their angle. And, of course, you know, me being an ex-pro, I see it from a, another angle as such. And then, you know, when I when I first got my – well, when I got my first job at Brentford, which was my one of my local teams I used to go and watch as a sort of 10, 12-year-old, um, my brother, oldest brother, Ted, who was a bit of a big influence on me, said to me, Steve, when you get a good letter – so remember, this is mid-80s, 87-ish. When you get a good letter, put it in a box below your desk on the left. And when you get a bad letter, put it in a box to your right. And when you're having a good spell, look at those ones <laughs> that are giving you grief. Um, when you're having a bad, when you're having a good bad spell, look at the other ones. And I think that's right. My brother Ted used to say to me, look, Steve, if two monkeys manage two football teams, one monkey has got to be the winning manager. So, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I think that um, I got a letter one day when I was managing Watford and we drew 1-1 with Southend. And this chap wrote with me this letter that arrived on the Monday. We, we got a 1-1 draw. And he said, so now, Steve, it's official. I've decided uh, uh, Barry, what was his name, manager of Southend, Barry Fry. Barry Fry is a, has officially got more passion for the game than you. Okay, so anyway, this chap put a number there, so I invited him in for a cup of tea, and a couple of days later, he arrived. So um, I said, it's explain passion to me he said well when they scored he ran up and down he jumped he fisted the air he was going for it and um when your team scored you just you were calm so he's got more passion than you i said well i've got to be honest with you i can't think when i'm shouting and screaming so actually if you put a ball between me and Barry Fry, 50-50 challenge. Who do you think's going to win it? I said, because I'm guaranteeing you I would win it. <laughs> so my passion comes from, yes, winning that ball, but also thinking about the game and thinking about what's coming next. I, I have this thing about, Bill Nicholson used it. It's a, chaps, what, what what do you think is the, the most important minute of a football match? And being young when he asked it, I didn't venture an answer because I thought it was a trick question. So I said, uh, so 
anyway, eventually, some answers. First minute, you want to start right. Last minute, you want to finish right, whatever. Anyway, he said, no. The next minute, the very next minute, is the most important one. You go 2-0 up and get carried away with yourself, you won't be 2-0 up for long. Oh, this is easy. Oh, look, what a great goal. We're 2-0 up. It's done. Finished. Game over. Well, very quickly, it'll be 2-1. 2-0 down, and you go too depressed. Oh, oh, going to have a bad weekend. You're very soon going to be 3-0 down. So the next minute is the most important one. And that's how I tend to look at this game. So I have been around long enough that I know that people deserve an opinion. Uh, if they could pick a better team than me, I'd get out the game. <laughs> and and basically, as a, as a footballer, as a footballer, Paul, I was successful because I understood me. I understood what I was and I understood what I wasn't. And I understood where I fitted in that team. You know, my role in in the the last team I was in, the the very good 80s team, was to supply Glenn with a ball. I knew we were going to be a better team the more Glenn Hoddle had the ball. So I made it my job to make sure I kept feeding him the ball, feeding him the ball. Now, you could say, well... You know that's that's you, that's a bit and um, you're not very ambitious if you're not going to go and do something yourself. No, I'm doing the best for my team. That's what I do. I'm a leader. I'm a captain. I'm a driver. That's what I do. I elevate the special talents like Glenn, like Ozzy, like Ricky, like Mickey Hazard. I elevate them up to do their their job. If those talents don't have the ball. They might as well not be there. So, so as a as a footballer, I understood what I was, what I had, my strengths as against other people's, and as a manager and as a coach, I knew my strengths absolutely. And what Eddie Bailey once said about me that uh, this kid, I think this was a seventeen year old, this kid's got a chance because his heart is much bigger than his head. And that's one of that's one of the quotes that I'll sort of take with me to my grave. Beautiful. So, so I'm, I, I know I'm talking a lot about me, but you, no, no, <laughs> you, you, you're asking me questions about me. So, yeah. of course. So, um, but I'm happy because I, I'm happy in my own skin. I'm happy what I did. I'd like to have won more for Tottenham. Wasn't to be. Um, I'd like to play for England more. Wasn't to be. Someone didn't want me. Guess what? I've tried my best. Um, but yeah, I'm 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 happy with Bill Nicholson taught me integrity of football. So I'm a bit like Ange. I don't like uh, kicking the ball away. I if we get a foul for us, I want to stop the ball and play. We play. We actually get the referee out of trouble because when they've given the free kick to us for a foul, there's about three players arguing with him and but stop the ball and play. You're getting the referee out of jail because they can't keep moaning with the ball moving and gone <laughs> away. You see how quick the goalkeeper plays for Ange? Yeah. Wonderful. I love it. I love it. I've been wanting that for the last 10, 15, 20 years of, of Tottenham's goalkeepers. And they all make out they want to play quick, but they don't play quick. Do, do you know what I mean? This fella yeah. plays quick, um, and and I like it. And if, if we get a free kick, stop the ball and play. Let's move it. Let's play. Let's play. And uh, don't I don't like the word game management. Oh, that's it. terrible. In, in probably... In my 19-year career, I probably had Keith Perkinshaw and Bill Nicholson for about 15, 16 of those 19 years. Not once did they say, kick the ball away. Not once did they say, run the ball to the corner flag to waste time. Not once did they say, 
kick the, their star player to put him out the game. Not once. And if we were one nil up, if we were one nil up and got pulled back to one one by the end of the game, you know what they'd say? It's your fault, chaps. You, 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 you didn't try hard enough for the second goal. You need to get a two-goal cushion before, not relax, but before you can feel a bit more safe and secure. So, so I'm, I'm very much going down the Ange route. And um, for instance, and I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, again, I'm talking about myself. But when my team won the yeah. won the league in Japan. We won it with the most goals, conceded the least goals, and had the best disciplinary record. I think that's I think that's fair play. All all round. In the right. attacking sense, in the defensive sense, and the way you try and play the game. And and I used to say to the players, yeah. because the Japanese players and, and Ange would have seen all of this. The Japanese players are hugely, hugely influenced by Brazilians. They get the star Brazilians when they're getting old, Dunga, etc. And and some not so good Brazilians, but they bring the Brazilian mentality to Japan. And you know what Brazilians want to do? Argue with a referee, pressure the referee, oh. kick the ball away. It's it's another form of cheating. And um, and do you know what that that had to be pointed out, and I had to say that on television. So I I I, I carried the flag for fair play, and I used to say to the to the to the Japanese, not everything from Brazil is top class. <laughs> trust me, trust me. If you're talking Pele and the, you know that team, yeah, top top class. Most of it is. Variation on a way to way to cheat. You, you mentioned fitting into a team there, Steve, and like even though it felt like growing up, it felt like you you were, you were always playing for Tottenham. It, it felt like you were just a, a, a constant there. And, and what you're talking about there, lack of you know game management was why well, it's so much fun to watch you you guys play week in and week out. There was ne- never you know time wasting playing for a draw. But something I've recently been doing particularly with the international breaks, is I've been watching more of Spurs games from the early 70s, which I haven't really seen much before until I started. Sure, 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 sure. Yeah. And, I, and I, I'm, so, I'm so used to you as a fullback, and then I see you as a midfielder, and it's like your Pape Matasar. The ball comes in, <laughs> then Steve Perryman appears, one or two touches, the ball goes off at some angle around the clock straight to another player. So... How did the change from being an excellent midfielder to a wonderful fullback come about? Was that was it a natural thing or an overnight thing? Yeah, yeah. So at school, I was a uh, uh, an inside forward, which I suppose is like a a forward thinking midfielder. A wing half would have been a more defensive midfielder. Anyway, so I was an inside forward, and uh, left school, joined Spurs, to the great Bill Nicholson. And he said to me when I walked in, Steve, if you play quick, easy and accurate, you'll have a career. And I trusted that man's opinion. I I followed his opinion. And when I said I knew my, knew my game, part of my game was listen to the instruction. Again, you work it out for yourself, but use the instruction. And um, so I was a... I, I developed into, I got my my debut as a 17-year-old. Why? Which was very unusual, because the team lacked some legs. So I came in with energy. I could play. I could pass. I could move the ball on, get it and play it, get it and play it, see it, play it. Uh, wasn't a dribbler by any means. Not really quick enough and not really tall enough. So I must have had something, and as Bill Nix, Nick Nicholson would describe it, Steve, Steve, <laughs> anticipation, son, anticipation. And, and that's basically, what do I think will happen next? And then 
as you play more games, more experience, you get a better decision maker on what you think is going to happen next. The ball is going to drop there. And I know it's going to drop there. And I move there before it, before it happens. So, so I, uh, I, expended a lot of energy as a defensive midfield player. I would have to... So I started off between Mallory and Peters, two oh, England wow. internationals. And I was the more defensive thinking of the three. Uh, Martin Peters was the more attacking of the three. And Mullers could do a bit of both. So that's that's the way that midfield was formed. And I was very happy as the young worker to be to be their apprentice, if you like, in footballing terms. Uh, these, these are two magnificent players. and uh, But, of course, they players get old. And now all of a sudden I'm coming to the fore now. I'm, I'm more experienced than anyone in the end. And so, anyway, what happens is your brain gets sharper, your decisions get better, my leadership improved as with more experience, and... Um, but your sort of legs start to go a bit. Right. So so it's now find a position that you can cope with with lesser legs. And that was fullback position. There wasn't many left wingers around in that, those days. And I I've got a defensive brain. I know how to defend. And it's oh, about arriving. It oh, it's but it but it was about brilliant. arriving. If 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 you if you if, the, if there's a lively winger, you don't let him get the ball and run at you. You're there as it arrives on him. Well, that's before he's got ahead of steam up. So um, I had good goalkeepers, great goalkeepers behind me, Pat Jennings, Ray Clements. And both of them would say to me, Steve, I'd rather deal with a cross than a shot. Right. Okay, that's right. So that's telling you where where you should be showing a player. And if he beats you, at least I know where it's coming from. It's, it's going to be a cross. And don't let him inside and have the whole goal to aim at. So, um, so yeah, it's, uh, it, was, it was a natural progression. I think I played for a lot of years because of my ability to change positions uh, from midfield. I played one of my best seasons was alongside the centre half, actually in Division Two when we when we got relegated, uh, and also at right back. And Keith sometimes, Keith Birkenshaw would would always pick a very flair driven midfield, and then all of a sudden you might be in a in not a great run of form or results, and he'd just put a little bit more meat in there. <laughs> and leave one leave one of the the superstars out, and I might be going in and doing that, you know, and and it's easier to to captain from the centre of midfield, but um, but I was delighted, I was happy to as long as I had a spur shirt on, as long as I was wearing that cockerel, you can play me <laughs> wherever you want, you just play, you just pick me and I'll play, and be happy to do so, and uh, probably wouldn't have been happy out on the left wing, but. Um, but yeah, and the first number I ever wore was eleven, because back in the day, they printed the program probably a week before the game, and Roger Morgan failed a fitness test, and I replaced Roger Morgan, and he was number eleven. So rather than change all the numbers around, Steve, you're in at number eleven. Well, I was never, I was never a left winger as long as I got a hole in my backside. So, um, uh. Some people think you, you, oh, Steve, you started at left wing. No, no, I'm, I'm always a midfield player, I'm always a defensive thinker, and um, yeah, so but great experience to play the different positions, and actually, it brings a new impetus to your career when you're seeing the game from a different angle at the back in midfield from right back and. I, I suppose I made myself selectable. Yeah, and I, I did that yeah. by, by knowing, knowing what the manager wanted. Have a discussion with him if I didn't agree. Eventually, you might have to agree to disagree. But there's only one manager. 
as as the coaches would say to me in my very young days as an apprentice, Steve, the manager is not always right, but is always the manager. And therefore, that means go down the line of what the manager wants. I come back to Ange. I come back to him. He's changed that mentality of these players. They are they are locking into his thoughts, his ethics, his style, and I love it. Yeah. I love it because Absolutely. because he sets the tone. Great managers set the tone of the club. Bill Nicholson. I played. I played for the two most successful managers in our history. They both set the tone of the club. They set the tone on your timekeeping, on your stress, on your how you speak to the other staff. They set the tone. And I've seen it. I don't know, Ange. I don't know it, but I get the feeling this man is setting the tone of, of everything. And, and do you know what? That's what you want out of a manager. You don't want him to leave this to them and that to them. And you, you know the levels there are now. There's the man on the yacht out somewhere in the world, the owner. Then there's Levy level. And then there's director of this and director of that. And there's so many different levels. Well, where does the manager sit in all that? I want the manager to set the tone. That's what I want him to do. Angel's an unstoppable force. I've been watching him for quite a while, you know, um, his Australian career. So when he came to Tottenham, it was just, oh, it's a dream come true. Now, I'm just looking at the Zoom thing. I didn't realise there was a time limit. I think we've got six minutes left. I might see if Wow. I, yeah, I didn't realise he had to pay. So I might see if I can do another call straight away. Yeah, but sure, sure, I'll sure. I'll just... Um, I'll just go, uh, there's quite a lot of love for you here in the, in the comments here, Steve. There's um, more than one people's mentioning Steve Perryman Sports, which is where I used to buy my gear in the hope that I, you'd be behind the counter. You never bloody were, well, but, you know, you're probably training well, to play football. Well, I used to, I used to do two weeks a year when my brother, who I own the shop with my brother, he would go away, rightly so, and I'd have to do two weeks a year, and I was like a caged tiger. <laughs> I... Can you imagine working outside, outdoors, in wind and rain and ice and snow and whatever, and now you're stuck in a shop and you can't move. You can't just lock the door and say closed. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, you got to be there. And yet some funny moments, I had, I had reps, representatives selling stuff come in and they'd say to me, uh, uh, can I speak to the owner? Yeah. <laughs> go, go on, go and get him. No, I, I'm the owner. Oh, <laughs> oh, and one of the other ones was this very nice lady walked in the shop one day, and she looked at me. And you don't jump on a customer straight away; you let them just relax and whatever. But she's looking at me, and then eventually I walked towards her, and she says. Have you got any Steve Perry, Fred Perryman shirts? <laughs> I said, you mean Fred Perry? Yes, yes, I'm sorry. Sorry, yeah, yeah, Fred Perry. So, great, great. I love I loved the shop. I, I hated the two weeks. <laughs> now, we've got, um, we got a commenter here. While you were playing for the men's team, uh, there's a lady called Ellie. She was playing for Tottenham ladies in the... Uh, in the eighties, and um, she's she, yeah. she's curious to know uh, what was the what was what was the thing that really cracked you up in the dressing room in your career at Tottenham. Um, that's interesting. Um, one day, we always had the meeting at two o'clock, and you always had to wear a collar and tie. That was Bill's thing. Got to be smart, and. Uh, this day, he named the team, and he said, I think you'll notice that Mike England is not here, and I've named him in the team. I'm thinking, yeah, where is he? And will he get fined? Although Bill Nicholson never fined anyone. And he said, he's going to be late, but he'll be here by about half past two. So 
get on with it. Mike's playing. When Mike eventually came in round about half past two, he was in a heavy sweater and jeans. Do you know what? I was in the garden. I was doing the garden. And I, I thought, Christ, it's Saturday. There's a game on. <laughs> I forgot all about a game. I mean, I'm thinking game from the second I woke up that morning. Of course, days before. But, but definitely, I, I, when you wake up, I'm thinking, how have you slept, Steve? Are your legs okay? Do you feel tired? I'm asking all these questions of myself. And Mike England was that experienced. He obviously didn't. He was going to do a bit of gardening before the game. Now, things like that just made me not necessarily crack up, but think, wow, how we're all different. How we're all different. And that's why that's why Bill Nicholson used to set the tone that I spoke about, because he had this thing that if you're all on the same page, Monday to Friday, and bearing in mind he would he would not treat Jimmy Greaves different to 17-year-old Steve Perriman because we played together for six months. But, you know, he'd be giving him different instructions to me. I'm a defensive thinker. He's obviously a forward thinker. Um, but you've got to be on the same page as per your dress, your timekeeping, this, that, the other, the, the manners. And um, if you were on the same page Monday to Friday, you had every better chance to be on the same page on the Saturday. And that's what you want, your team to be on the same page. Very clever. Very simple, but very clever. So, yeah. Do you think that like, just watching football, as, now it, it looks to me like, um, I don't know, it looks like the individuality has been coached out of players that, you know, it, it doesn't look to me as if footballers are expressing themselves more that they're, that they've got very rigid plans in place and, you know, the, the the tactical team talks are probably very, very detailed, or it sounds like in your yeah. way it was kind of you're trusted yeah. to play a game of football. I think um, I think what happened was that uh, 66 World Cup, everyone before that was playing 4-2-4 with two wingers. Wow. Wingers were the entertainers. The English crowd would love a winger to take on the fullback and cross it. That's what they wanted. Um, Ramsey turned us into a 4-4-2. It didn't have room for wingers. And the wide midfield players had to be workers and runners. Steve, I think yes, this is, sorry, to... sorry, Steve, I think he's going to cut off. I'll try and do another Zoom meeting and get you okay, back on please. stop. Sorry, man. And we carry, and we carry on. No problem. <laughs> no problem. I'll, I'll, do, I'll, I'll do it now. So bear with okay. us, folks. Go. Okay. Go, go. <laughs> Okay, folks. I'm, I've just um, I've just sent Steve the uh, the link to another meeting. There, <laughs> I didn't know there was a time limit on Zoom meetings, so hopefully Steve will be in with us in a second. I'll just message him.
How fun is this, eh? How fun is this? Um, <clears throat> so Steve, Steve can't use StreamYard on his computer while we're doing Zoom, which is why it's all a bit higgledy piggledy. Sorry, I haven't been able to bring up chats, folks. Um, but you're all in here having a good old time, which is which is nice to see. Nice to see Arsenal losing this morning as well. <clears throat> uh, but we've got a load of people in. Hello, Mark. Hello, all the Hotspur Hippie Commune members. We've got one of the two Ronnies in here. Hopefully I've done the link right. Sometimes it's a bit, you know... <laughs> Just try it again in case I've got that wrong. Oh, we're back. Hello. Seamless. Seamless. It like yeah, it, it like it never happened. Well done. Well done. <laughs> the other thing, the other thing that was quite funny in the dressing room was that uh, managers, of course, are experienced and they're getting older year by year. And Bill Nicholson always, but always, got the two names mixed up: <laughs> of Crystal Palace and Queens Park Rangers. So we were all waiting for the mistake. No one was brave enough to laugh. But the eyes were going around the room when Bill Nicholson, meaning to talk about QPR, would mention Crystal Palace, and then when it, the opposite as well. And um, so things like that were quite funny. And also, Bill Nicholson always, always criticised Cyril Knowles, the left back. Wow, nice one, Cyril. Nice one, Cyril. I've been, I've been watching him in the in the seventies. I mean, talk about a progressive fullback. He was, he wonderful, was incredible. Wonderful left foot. Wonderful left foot and should have played more for England and uh, was a tough boy. Oh, what a tough tackler. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, but Bill Nicholson, for some reason, always picked on Cyril at the end of games. That this wasn't right or that wasn't right. And you could just see Cyril's face. Oh, don't, I said don't. So, yeah. So maybe because he was having to go at Cyril, we stayed off other people, but yeah. I've been I've been watching your your podcast since you've been doing it, and um, it uh, over the, I guess like a lot of us over the last uh, well, especially like towards the end of last season, a, a lot of us were sort of scratching our heads, thinking, "What's going wrong with this club?" You know, it's uh, it was it was looking pretty dark there, and. And, uh, and now Ange's come in. Uh, you, you seem to be quite upbeat and enjoying watching the football again. And, uh, and we're having a bit of a, a blip because we've got one or two injuries at the moment. But you, you're you quite happy with how we're going at the moment, Steve? Absolutely. It's a blip. It's a blip. Um, this is not his best 11. Having said that, you very rarely are able to pick your best 11. But, you know, this he's, he's got about five or six of his best 11. And that takes a hell of a lot of getting over. And actually, the way we've nearly got over it, I would say early on in the season, um, the ball was bouncing our way. Deservedly so, because we had tempo, we had teamwork, we had passion, we had fire, we had energy. We had new players wanting to pr improve, impress us all with that they could play and, be, and warrant their transfer fee. And the ball definitely went our way. And then all of a sudden it changed. It wasn't, the ball was not falling for us. You know, there'd be the, the minute offside in certain situations and and the, the odd mistake or two was creeping in. And um, and, and that comes with that the squad is not deep enough Um what he's done in such a short time is nigh on a miracle. From where they were before he came, more people said to me before Ange was appointed, Steve, 
I think I might be sort of throwing my ticket in. I, I'm not enjoying it. Um, I don't feel a link with the club. Uh, I think they're going into a different direction that, that I understand. Off the field, but on it as well. You know, they, they, they don't quite understand the Levy aspect to, you know, building a, of course, a great stadium, but, you know, the other sports um, allied to that stadium. Um, and by the way, if the, the financial fair play comes into play, if it really comes into play and is adhered to, Levy will probably be looked on as a, as a magician for what he's doing. I'm not saying I like it with regard to, I'm not saying I like it with regard to my football club because it's, it's my club, it's your club, it's our club. Yeah. Um, but, uh, so, off the field, on the field, I went, I very rarely go to games. I don't, I can't stand traffic. I cannot stand it. <laughs> and anyway, I went to the AC Milan game, home game. We were a goal behind. Oh. The crowd, the crowd were up for it. 60 odd thousand people were so up for it. And after 15 minutes, you know, the crowd went, we're not doing it. We're not, we're not going to do it. We haven't, we haven't got the fire in our bellies. And at the end, at the end, they weren't even angry. I think we, I think Harry had a header at goal after 85 minutes. They weren't even angry because they were sort of comatose. Yeah. The, I mean, you, you're a goal behind to be able to get to the next round of the Champions League that you've sort of done miracles to get there in the first place because Conte did get us up to that point of of qualifying for the Champions League and we went out with a whimper. And we played Chelsea four times, maybe the season before. Four times, we never laid a glove on them. People like Rudiger was bullying the life out of us. And no one stepped up to him. Tottenham people, Tottenham people are brave. They support their club. They support their team. They'll follow you into Division 2, because that's what they did with my team. They followed us into Division 2 to help us get back again. They know what they're seeing. They know. They know if the players are at it or they're not at it. And, well... Just... It was quite. Um, I, I found that match to be quite sad because, because, but mainly because UK, UK. I remember you came on at half time, and I'm thinking, well, that just tells you how far this club's gone when you've got the guy that scored two against AC Milan in in that circumstance, and and now we're defending a one nil deficit, and it was just yeah. horrible yeah. to watch. If you if you remember that AC Milan game all those years ago, that. When we played that home game against them, that was our fourth game in six days. Jeez. Fourth game in six days. If you find find the um, the YouTube of it, oh, I think there's about it. an hour. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you tell me there's any tiredness on that field, no, I'll yeah. have an argument with you. <laughs> there's not tiredness. And we were a goal down. And we were a goal down. Now, I, I, again, I'm talking about myself because I happened in this one game in my life to score two goals, but not bad goals either, man. Were they? they no, were... good, very good goals actually. <laughs> but, but we were on it. We were at it, and of course, you're only taking a one goal to Milan, and Muller scored. Muller's who'd come back from Fulham on loan, scored, and ended up scoring the the, the Wolves winning goal actually. So, but we were at it. We were at, we, what are you going to do if you're a goal behind? Sit back and say, well, let's just get beat 1-0. No. So so there was lots of things where good, solid Tottenham people were saying, were questioning their decision about carrying on down this line. I'm not saying they'd have switched off to Tottenham 100%. 
course, they'd have watched the game on televisions and been interested and, and hope for wins. But were they going to pay their money? Were they getting value for money? No, they weren't. No, they weren't. Wow. And and this breath of fresh air comes into the club and is talking common sense. He's saying things that we understand. He's not overdoing the tactics part of it. He's just saying, we, we don't stop. We don't stop. We, if we have a goal up, we don't stop. The, 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 the opponents want us to stop. The only time we stop is at half time and at the end. We don't stop. You know what? For him to play the pure way that he's thinking, we need to have our as close to our best 11 players. And in when he's got another window or two or three, that top 11 will become a top 13, top 15, top 18, and then watch us go. Watch us go. Well, we had, we had quite a few players out for the um, for the second leg of the 84 UEFA Cup final, but um, I remember the boys did all right that night, didn't they? So... <laughs> No, that wanted... was a victory. That was a victory for homegrown talent. Yeah, absolutely. No. And and let me tell you about that because because no me suspended, no Glenn Hoddle injured, no Ray Clements. Although I think Ray was on the bench. I think Keith opted to play Tony Parks in in place of Ray Clements. That's what that's what a manager gets paid wow. for. This those sort that's of decisions. Decision, eh? So um, no Garth Crooks. Um, so people like Falco, Hazard, Hutton, Miller, two non-leaguers, uh, Roberts and Galvin, Parks. Wow, and uh, two two smaller buys, Mabber and Stevens. <laughs> not not top 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 liners, but but good solid people and pros, and. Keith Birkinshaw and his wife used to travel on a bus on a Sunday with the under-15s and under-13s and their parents to go and play at Southampton. He would travel on the bus so that those parents could see them. He would know their names. And not all of those kids are going to make it. Of course they don't. But the ones who do make it, you know what? They're real Tottenham homegrown players. There's your reward, Keith. On your last day, when the club said they didn't want you in the quarterfinal, there's your reward for those for those afternoons on Sundays that you spent on a on a mini not a mini bus like a, a coach traveling all those miles, having won or lost on the Saturday, and putting yourself in front of the parents. That's care. That's mm. care. And um, we we need to keep that um, that flow going of homegrown talent. And um, it's probably one thing that's disappointed me so far that that you know <clears throat> put put one in, put one in. Dorrington, but, stick him in. But but actually, actually, Hans knows whether they're right, whether yeah. they're ready. He knows. And um, I keep coming back to the same thing. The main, the main power, one of the only powers that the manager has is his selection. His selection. And you cannot interfere with his selection. You can't. It's his team. It's his team. None of our teams have ever won a game or lost a game because it's never happened. It's never happened. We might like this one or that. We, you might think, well, he should be playing dire in these circumstances. <clears throat> Do you know what? No, no, I, no, absolutely not. But some people think that. And they, they're entitled to their opinion. But we've seen enough of this player over the last three years to say... Oh, we've seen an awful no. lot. <laughs> we've seen an awful Recover lot. Recover to goal. If you're a backline player... And the ball is closer to your goal line than you are. You should be sprinting, running, yeah, sprinting to, not, not to, looking to at with your the finger. care. Well, how good do I look running yeah. back? 
Anyway, so um, <laughs> but but the, the players have, have fed into it. They fed into this way, and of course, there's going to be a little bit of a a, a jump uh, because maybe they weren't enjoying playing under the last two managers. Yeah. It, it looked it did, like they it, weren't it, enjoying playing. It looked like they totally lost interest. Yeah, you know, yeah. Six one. Harry, Newcastle. Harry was Harry was because he's like that's his focus there. I'm gonna score goals. I'm Six. gonna get the golden boot. I'm gonna I'm gonna get this record. I'm gonna play for England. And but some of the others with less focus weren't focused at all. So uh, that was what's particularly disappointing. You know what we want to ask? You know what we want? We want a team that's going out there and trying their best, running their best. As Bill Nicholson used to say, don't come off that, don't come off that field fresh. Yeah. You come off the f- field fresh. You haven't done your job. You should come off absolutely shattered. And then you spend after the game and the next day getting yourself ready. Back to the AC Milan game. Four games in six days. Oh, what about the recovery period there? How did you spend that? How did would I was I stood in my shop during those four in six days? No, I wasn't. No. So I'm um, feet up resting. I saw I saw a, a quote um, by Pat Jennings um, uh, about you on the Spurs website, and it said that that as a as a captain. Uh, you got players into the Tottenham way. I just what what does the what does the Tottenham way mean to you, and how is it unique to Tottenham Hotspur as opposed to other teams? I come back to the Bill Nicholson. Um, I'm a disciple of Bill Nicholson. His integrity, his style. Uh, Steve, just do it. Do it right. It's as easy to do it right as do it wrong. Just do it right. And and I spend hours talking to players from that era what Bill Nicholson gave to us. It was a belief in the club, a belief in in the surroundings. Uh, Bill Nick would say, who's the most important people at this club? Again, being young, don't answer, keep quiet. And he'd say, the supporters, I'll be gone one day, you'll be gone one day. The supporters stay here. They support their club. And don't think they're mugs, by the way. They understand a lot more about the game than you you actually think they do. So it's like a respect. I I always tell this story. So I'm 18, just in the team, and I finish training one day. I come out onto the high road and I turn left. I maybe have to go back for a a bit of treatment in the afternoon. I turn left, and just by the Bell and Hare pub there uh, was a cafe. I think it was called Tony's. And the ground staff, the people that sweep up, the people that uh, mend the lights, uh, et cetera, the ground staff, um, All seemed older gentlemen, uh, but it was probably a gang of about 12 of them. And they'd be in there having their 11s, his cup of tea. And I'd be queuing up for maybe a cup of tea and a cake or whatever. And one would say, Steve, yeah, any chance you can have a shot? (laughs) And so I'd smile and just, just make out it's your birthday, eh? Just... Just try and have a shot a bit more. So this is what what could be described as the lowest of the low workers at Tottenham. I'm not high, 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 but I'm I'm sort of in the first team. So, you know, and I'm accepting what they tell me because they want the best for that club. That club as people... People live their lives through that club. They travel the world because of that club. They get home at three o'clock in the morning and have to be up at five to go to work for that club, to support that club. So so um, 
I I took it as on on my shoulders that these people that join our club. Gary Stevens said one day he was in there. The, the, we signed him off the back of his cup final appearance uh, for Brighton against uh, Man United. And he said he's in the he's in the dressing room and he's talking to someone about the final and this and that and I was on television and what and I said to him, "Oh, played the fucking cup final, have you?" <laughs> As though that's done, it's finished. And Garth Crooks tells me that that when he signed for sort of big money from Stoke and Archie at the same time, and they both started off right and they're both scoring goals and they're delighted with themselves. And I said to him, apparently, well, I said to Garth, and he told Archie, um, Garth, that's fucking don't mean a thing until we win something. Not a thing. This club has to win things. And he told straight away, went and told Archie, and Archie said, yeah. He said the same to me as well. (laughs) Well, well, I I come back to the, the captaincy leadership thing. You know, it's... It's not a it's not a popularity contest. If you want to be friends with everyone, don't be the captain. Because if you are friends with everyone, it means you're not doing your job. And your job is to, of course, back the manager up sometimes. But actually, when we didn't think he was right, I'd have to speak. So maybe he's not going to like me. And someone like Irving Scholar. Oh. When he's telling me, when he's telling me because of the new stand, and we while they were building the new stand, we had to park up the high road, and he's telling me, uh, Steve, the stand's nearly finished. Oh yeah, yeah, great, yeah. Um, you know, you had to park up the high road, yeah. When the stand's finished, uh, you you still have to park up the high road. Run that past me again. Why why would that be? Well, we've got 72 private boxes and we're giving every box two uh, two, uh, car park passes. Is that right? So you've heard about the committee lately at Tottenham, a a committee of this or that. That seems to be dismantled quite nicely. Fuck off. (laughs) Committee, my God. Anyway, do you think I needed a committee to say to Scholar, do you know what? If that's the way this club's going, you've not got a prayer. Yeah. Not a prayer. So he didn't do it. He didn't do it. He only gave them one car park pass each. Well, did I need a committee? No. Did I need to rally round the players and say, you know, we're going strike, eh? We're not having this. No. Bosh, in you go. When it, when I was in Japan, <laughs> I was with Ozzy. I was Ozzy's assistant for three years. And... um Ozzy decided he wanted to get back into European football, so he went to Croatia, a big job in Croatia. And I took over, and this is the point. I really like the Japanese, but this is the point where they can claw a bit back. So they call me into a meeting, and they say, uh, parents and son, um, last season we travelled a uh, green car. Green car's first class. Yeah, Um this season, you, your 11, green car. Staff, squad, second class. No. What? No. No? No. Listen, we've just spent three years making this a family together. Biggest word in Japan is Ishoni together. Wow. Ishoni. I said, we have spent three years making this a family together and you're going to break it up. No. We will all travel first class or we will all travel second class. Your choice. And walked out. Well, you got a call of players meeting for that or a committee or, or no. No. Football rules. Football rules. So so um I wanted I wanted for them to know how important this club they'd signed for, how much respect mattered, how much the crowd mattered, 
pay respect to our history. You see, an old, you see Bobby Smith, you see Terry Dyson, you go and ask them if you, they need any help. <laughs> because, because they deserve it. Yeah, yeah. They're the legends of our club. They, they won the double, these people. Ron Henry was a great mentor for me coming up through the teams. Guess what? I loved him. I just loved him. And they got threepence for doing it. They got threepence. And a club that doesn't pay respect to the history has not got a future. Yeah. I do worry about that these days. I, I worry about it. that. I think, I think a lot of the fans would at least, at least like to see a Bill Nicholson statue at the ground, something, you know, because it gives people chatting, you know, who's Absolutely. that granddad? Absolutely. Oh, that's Absolutely. Bill Nicholson, and then the, Absolutely. the story continues, doesn't it? They, well, they made a, 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 someone made a very nice bust of Bill Nicholson, and it used to be in the reception of the the old right. uh, West Stand. And apparently, uh, apparently, I don't know if this is true or not, but apparently, when Sugar's first day, oh. he said, "Who's that? Who's that?" And the lady said, "It's Bill Nicholson." Get sure of it. So it had to be put out of sight somewhere. Well, mm, not a clue. No. Not a clue. No, 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 no. So, well, Steve, you've 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 you, you said an hour and an hour is here. I could have I could talk to you all day, man. I've really enjoyed this. You know, just personally, you know, when I when I I started uh, going to matches um, in uh, 84, 85, and okay. um, you know, seeing you guys and what you. The, the, the bonkers football Tottenham used to play in those days. You know, I didn't have a great time at school, but the crowd there, it was all from all sorts of walks of life because the season ticket was only 36 quid at the time for a child. Yeah, absolutely. So anyone could go. And I don't think the old ducks on the turnstiles were too strict if you, you know, when the attendance absolutely. would come out at half time, today's attendance is 17,000. <laughs> you think, what? You know, no, that. no. But it, you, 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 and all the other guys, you just made people's lives better, Steve. And it, it, the shelf for me was the best place on planet Earth. It was rocking. So thank you very well, much. Well, it was a, it was a privilege for me to play for Tottenham. It, I'm so proud to be have, to have him played the most games. Um, I'm just looking at this new shirt book that's out. You know, I, I wore that shirt over 850 plus times. <laughs> And, and I don't think I ever took it for granted, ever. And I'm, I'm reading about Bill Nicholson and his influences were Arthur Rowe and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and all these people that fed into Bill. And then Bill fed all that knowledge into me. Wow. So I've got all those via Bill Nick. Yeah. And um, so... Uh, I, do you know I played half of my career with no sponsor on the shirts, no adverts around the ground, and no adverts in the program. That's how old I am. Yeah, yeah, incredible, man. And now there's adverts everywhere. It was looked upon as dirty money. The, the advertising money was looked. At, we don't need that type of money. No. Oh. Well, there's, oh. a, there's a lot more dirty money in the game now with the with all the gambling oh, you, that's been shut down. Bet your life, north, right? Bet your life. But I'm very positive to Ange. Excellent. I'm very positive to the feeling. I'm very positive to uh, the crowd staying on at the end of games and applauding the players off oh. when they think they've given effort. Amazing. Um, can you imagine how many Spurs people I speak to a week? My God. <laughs> the feeling is... And of course we've had a blip. Of course we have. We was always going to have a blip. We, the squad is not deep enough. But I'm telling you, we got the right man. I'm not, I don't need to convince you, but no, we've got no, the right I'm man. No, i man. Long ago, man. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. look, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying your podcast. I'm looking forward to, Great. This, to the, the Great. second half because I didn't know you were a bit of a mote on aficionado. So I'm enjoying oh, that chat absolutely. with uh, absolutely. Leo Delaney. Thank you so much for your time, Steve. Thanks Pleasure. Thanks for your service to the club. Paul, I will, I will come and speak to you at any time you Brilliant. want. Brilliant. Thank you oh, so you much. Know, you, know, you know how to get hold of me. I certainly do. And um, thank you and all your people there for your support. Um, I, I've been to Australia once with the club 
in the mid 70s. I think they went again in the mid 80s, but I didn't. I had an operation during the summer, a knee operation, so I couldn't go. But uh, I loved it. You to get I ready just for, loved you it. You have to get ready for your next 300 odd appearances for Tottenham, I suppose. That's Absolutely. <laughs> I, well, I used I used the summer to get stuff done. Right. That's when I, that's when I had operations, and yeah. But Excellent. I'm still I'm still very positive to what we're going to do. Me too, man. And, I'm loving and it. And good luck to you. Great, great to speak to you. Thank you very much, Steve. I'll see you next time. Good week. luck, troops. All you Spurs people. Come on, you Spurs. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Thank you. Nice to see you. Okay, folks. Uh... Hello, it's me. Hang on. Yeah, it's all working. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, folks. That was a... Uh... That was a real thrill. That was a real thrill for me. What a what a fantastic guy Steve Perryman is. Hey, uh, you know we had a little chat before came on and uh, wow, uh, very impressive, very impressive. So uh, if you want to know more about the Tottenham way, you got to go to Steve Perryman's podcast. It's on YouTube. It's fantastic uh, when he talks about the club. It uh, it would behoove you to pay attention. Um, now, as I said at the outset. I've disabled super chats and uh, whatnot for this uh, for this stream. If you want to say thank you uh, to to me and Steve, there's a link for a, a, a charity that Steve's an ambassador for, the Aortic Dissection Charitable Trust. Click on the link, buy them a few quid, and uh, I'll be around soon. I, I, so I'll, I'll get the stream in order so I can do chat as usual. It was a bit it was a bit higgledy piggledy this morning. Uh, getting Zoom working and uh, the comments were a bit vague. So I'm really sorry um, I didn't get through to m many people's questions. I mean, Steve, you know, I'll just, just let Steve talk, really. I didn't want to I didn't want to interrupt the guy because he, he's interesting. So, uh, but if Steve comes on again, I'm, I'm sure I can make more of an effort with that, folks. But uh, what a thrill. What a thrill. Steve Perryman. <laughs> so I've only got Aussie R dealers. And uh, Debbie Harry to go, and uh, I've done my I've done my uh, my bedroom poster trifecta then. So come on, Aussie, come on, Debbie, come on board. Um, I'm excited. He's got me excited about Tottenham. How's he do that? Excited about Tottenham. Arsenal lost. We got Newcastle tomorrow. We can make some inroads. Title challenge might not be over yet, folks. Oh, I'm pumped. I'm pumped. Look, I'll just leave it there, folks. In uh, uh, I don't know what I'm clicking here. Hang on, I'm all, I'm all, I'm all a buzz. I'm all a buzz. I'll see you a bit later, folks. Until then, peace and love, man, and come on, you Spurs. <laughs>